Let me wish you a good evening. Hope you're having a great week. Welcome to our services here at Gloucester Street Church of Christ. If you're visiting here with us. You're an honored guest of ours, and we're so glad to have you with us. Our congratulations go to Gary and Carolyn Martin on the birth of their granddaughter, Holly Jane Martin. Yesterday, July 26, she weighed seven pounds and two ounces and was 20 inches long. Proud parents are Stephen and Paige Martin of Birmingham, Alabama. So glad for them. We received a card from the family of Frank Castles. It's been placed on the bulletin board. I want to mention to you a name added to our prayer list. This is Nancy Crump's brother, Frank Alford. So keep him in your prayers. There will be a meeting for parents of those in grades 7th through 12th after our services Sunday evening, July 31st, to set up the TNT area-wide meeting schedule. You can see George Heath if you need more information on that. And remember our goal Sunday coming up on July 31st. We'll have a potluck lunch afterwards for our guests to stay and enjoy with us. Philip Crow will lead our singing. Greg Jones has our lesson. And Bradley Williams will dismiss us to our class of closing prayer. You have a songbook, turn to 843. 843. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul. Imagine it's a uh, Saturday afternoon and you're, you're sitting around your house. Uh, you've had just a nice leisure day, uh, whether just watching TV or uh, working in the yard or whatever, and you decide to go in the kitchen, either to fix yourself a, a nice snack or fix supper for that night or whatever. And uh, you get to looking around the kitchen and you, you're missing a key ingredient. And uh, if you're like me or or if you're like Marsha or myself, uh, you want that ingredient because you've got your mind set on something, and that's what you want. And uh, you say, it's time to make a Walmart run. And I think we've all probably done that. You know, we're gonna, meaning we're gonna make a quick run to Walmart, we're gonna pick up that item, and then we're coming back home. And in the process of uh, getting ready for that quick Walmart run, you may look at a mirror. And you may look at your shirt. My hair may be, you know, it's just, 
uh, I haven't done anything about my appearance. And that's okay because everybody needs to leave your day from time to time and nothing against Walmart, but after all, it's just a Walmart run. But where the danger goes is when we look into our a spiritual mirror or the word of God and, hey, I need to change. And I'm not willing to do that. Just for a couple of minutes tonight, just for a few minutes, I'd like for us to look at James chapter 1. It um, sort of alludes to this. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25. It says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So first of all, the person who hears the word of God and is not a doer. It's just like me when I make my Walmart run. I'm not willing to change anything. How many times have you or know of, you know of someone who sat through a worship service and said, hey, the preacher made a good point. I need to make a change in my life, whether it's to become a Christian or there, there's something I need to repent of, or maybe there's just something that I need to do better. And uh, I walk out the door, I may even say, enjoy your lesson to whoever it was that preached that sermon. Or I could be sitting in a Bible class, same situation. That's a good point. I need to make a change, but I do not do it. I walk out the door, I go home. Maybe I'm studying the Bible at the home, at my home. Same scenario. Not willing to change. I'm just like this person who looked at himself in a mirror and didn't do anything about it. I go on and I forget. Maybe it's because of selfish reasons. They're not willing to change or give that sin up. Uh, I think it's also part of the problem is uh, we're not willing to make an effort sometimes. Making a change takes effort, especially when you're trying to do right or realize that you need to do something better. It takes effort and make a change in their life. It says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. This is the person that when he studies the Bible, he reads the Bible, he hears a lesson, and he knew, knows he needs to make a change, whether it's to become a Christian or, or do something better or repent or something. He takes care of it. He does it. He remembers what he sees, and he does something about him. Notice it says, He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. He continues to do what's right. He continues to do what God says. The New American Standard uses a term that I, I really like. It says, he who looks intently into the law of liberty. If you look intently into something, you concentrate on it. Uh, you try to apply it. You earnestly look, are seeking the truth. So in whatever case it may be, if you look intently into the word of God, and you change, you make that necessary change. It goes on to say this one will be blessed in what he does. How all will that person be blessed? Well, there's many ways. This person is blessed because he's now doing the will of God. He's living according to God's word. Uh, he does not have the burden of sin because he's been forgiven of his sins. He does not have the thought in his mind, well, I know to do better and I'm not. You know. So that person who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, the spiritual mirror, and he's willing to make a change, uh, he's blessed. He's happy because he knows he's a Christian. He knows he's living in God's favor. You know, it could be something tonight that, that maybe you just need to do better. Maybe you know, hey, I need to fellowship with other Christians more than what I do. Maybe I should study more. Maybe I should pray more. And uh, that's all good. But be willing to make a change when there's things that you need to repent of or to become a Christian as well. We can have that peace knowing that we're serving God. We can know that um, 
we're living in an acceptable way to him. We have hope in our lives. We know that we have salvation. So tonight, don't be like the person that looks into the mirror and forgets what he saw. Don't, do not be like me that needs to make the Walmart run and you know, just does not care and goes on. Be that person that looks into the perfect law of liberty, that hears the word of God and is willing to do it. If you're here tonight and you need to become a Christian, don't put that off any longer. Do so tonight. Or if you're here and you haven't lived as a Christian should, there's things you need to repent of, or maybe you just need prayers for strength. Won't you come forward now as we stand to sing? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. day. We thank you for all the many blessings of life you've given us. We thank you for this opportunity to come out and study that word, this midweek Bible study. We ask that we would take the things that we learned tonight and apply them to our lives. It might make us better Christians, better able to serve thee. We ask that you would be with all those that were mentioned as being sick here. Those with this number, we ask that you would watch over and care for them, bring them back to their appointed ways in life. We ask you to be with all of us here as we go to our classes. Forgive us where we fail thee in Christ and we pray. Amen. We are on our last of these video lessons tonight. So you may be sad or you may applaud that. But <laughs> regardless, we will move on to something else next week. Y'all keep in mind, please, our uh, Goal Sunday. It's coming up this weekend. We've got a beautiful kitchen over there in the annex. And more importantly, we've got an opportunity to get together, to fellowship. We haven't in a long time. It's, uh, it's exciting to do that. Care groups will be starting again before long. We've missed that opportunity for fellowship to spend some time with each other. Some of y'all are looking at me funny. It is Sunday, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that means cook. Remember to cook. Right, yes. Please remember to bring food. That's what I should have said. There's always plenty. We, we hope everybody gets to stay for that and spend some time. Before we start tonight, let's, uh, let's have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this, for this day, for this opportunity that we have to be together, to study thy word. We're thankful for this congregation, for what it means to all of us. Father, we are mindful of the life of Christ, the time that he spent here on this earth. We're thankful for this opportunity that we've had to study him. Above all things, we thank thee for the opportunity we have for salvation for the sacrifice that was made for our sins. We pray, Father, that you would be with us always. Strengthen us day by day. Be with those that are sick, those that are grieving. Strengthen us spiritually, Father. Help us always to keep our minds on thy will. Help us, Father, to follow thy will every day. We ask thy forgiveness when we fail thee. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we are studying in Luke chapter 24 tonight. 
the uh, the scene on the road to Emmaus, and then shortly thereafter. So we'll read tonight verses 13 through 35. Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not, when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. And he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, and blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Luke does a beautiful job of telling us the story of Jesus from the story of his birth all the way through his resurrection and what happens in Luke chapter 24, the very last chapter of this account. We see Jesus's compassion and action. In this particular lesson, we're looking forward to one of our graduate students. He's currently enrolled working on a Master of Divinity degree, Tyler Alverson, delivering our lesson. Tyler now preaches at the Seven Oaks Congregation in Mayfield, Kentucky, where he and his wife Leslie serve alongside of one another and benefit and bless many who know them. We're looking forward to this particular lesson presented by Tyler on Jesus and Revelation from Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Looking at the first couple of verses of this amazing story that we find in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, we find two of Jesus' disciples walking down a road to Emmaus. They're traveling from the city of Jerusalem to this small village of Emmaus, about a seven-mile journey. As we look in Luke chapter 24 and verse number 14, Luke gives us some details about what they were doing as they walked down this road. The Bible says that they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. What had happened? What had taken place? What were they discussing as they walked down the road? If you skip down just a little bit in Luke chapter 24 to verses 19 through 24, Luke actually gives us some insight into this conversation that was taking place. They were talking about their master. They were talking about their teacher. They were talking and discussing about Jesus. According to what we find in Luke chapter 24, they were discussing Jesus' identity, how He was a prophet, mighty in word and deed before God and all the people. They were discussing Jesus' death, which had taken place just three days earlier. 
They were talking about how he was delivered over by the Jewish religious leaders into the hands of the Romans, how he was executed and put to death. They were talking about his mysterious missing body. This is the first day of the week as the two disciples are walking down the road alongside of each other. They had had heard a couple of different reports that morning about Jesus' body, how it was nowhere to be found. It wasn't in the tomb any longer. They were amazed by that. They really didn't know what to make of that. So we look at the first two verses of this amazing story in the Gospel of Luke. We see two of Jesus' disciples walking down the road to Emmaus, talking about their Lord, talking about Jesus. But that's not really the main emphasis of this text. The main emphasis of this text, the main emphasis of this story is not what these two disciples were doing. The main emphasis is what happened to them. If you look in Luke chapter 24 and verse 15, the Bible says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? As they're walking down the road side by side, all of a sudden a third traveler joins them and it's Jesus. Jesus is not distant from them. Jesus draws near to them. Jesus isn't walking with them only when it's convenient for him. No, Jesus is walking with them every step of the way as they go down the road towards Emmaus. Have you ever read a Where's Waldo book before? I don't know about you, but for me, they can be kind of frustrating. If you've never read a Where's Waldo book before out of a picture that takes up both pages, when you open up the book, there's all kinds of different people doing all kinds of different things, and you're trying to find one tall, slender man wearing a red and white striped shirt. If you're like me, Where's Waldo can be a hard question to answer. It can be a frustrating question to answer where you just want to close the book and put it away, never to pick it up again. Perhaps sometimes an even more difficult question for us to answer as Christians is not where's Waldo, but where's Jesus? Life can be so difficult. Life can be so challenging and hard. Life oftentimes brings very painful circumstances, circumstances that leave us asking, Circumstances that leave us wondering, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in the midst of all of this pain? Where is Jesus in the midst of all of this difficulty? I, I believe, and I want to suggest to you that the words of Luke chapter 24 and verse 15 not only apply to these two disciples in the story, but they also apply to us. Where is Jesus, especially when life gets hard? Jesus is not distant from us. Jesus draws near to us. Jesus doesn't just walk with us whenever it's convenient for Him. No, Jesus walks with us every step of the way as we go down the path of life together. Let's explore that idea. As we work through this text and work through this story in Luke chapter 24, let's take a few minutes to reflect on the presence of Jesus in our lives. Number one. Jesus is present, according to verse 16, even when we don't recognize it. In verse 15, like we said a moment ago, Jesus draws near and begins to walk with these two disciples. Luke gives us a little note in verse 16 that the two disciples' eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. Whether this is because of their own spiritual blindness or whether this is something that God did to them intentionally in His sovereignty, Jesus is close to them. Jesus is walking with them. He's drawing near to them, but they don't recognize it. Even though they don't recognize the presence of Jesus as they walk down the road, He's still there. He's still present. And I believe the same thing is true in our lives. Jesus is present in our lives even when we don't recognize it. Like we said a few moments ago, we go through trials, we go through difficulties, we go through hardships, and they sometimes leave us asking, where is Jesus? They sometimes leave us feeling like Jesus has left us. They leave us feeling as if Jesus is distant from us even when we don't recognize it. Even when we don't think it to be the case, even when we don't feel it in our hearts, Jesus is close. Jesus is present. Jesus is walking with us. Number two, 
Jesus is present in our lives, according to verse 17, even when we're sad. As Jesus draws near and begins to walk with these two disciples, in verse 17, He asked them a question. He asked them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? What are you discussing? What are you talking about? Before they answer that question audibly, before they say anything in response to Jesus' question, you can see what they were talking about by the looks that they had on their face. The Bible says that they stood still looking sad. They were sad that their master, they were sad that their teacher had been crucified. They were sad, sorrowful that he had been put to death. And you could see it written all over their faces. Maybe they even had tears streaming down their cheeks. Even though they were sad, notice that Jesus is still there. Jesus is still present with them. Jesus is still walking with them again. I think the same thing is true in our lives. Jesus is present with us as followers of His, even when we're sad. Have you ever had a fair weather friend before? Have you ever had a friend who's only around whenever things are going well? Have you ever had a friend who only wants to be around you when they can get something out of you? Whenever something goes wrong, though, whenever something difficult happens, this friend is nowhere to be found. You know, nobody wants a fair weather friend. Here's the good news Jesus is not a fair weather friend. Jesus doesn't just draw near to us whenever things are going well in our lives. Jesus doesn't just walk with us whenever it's convenient for him or when he can get something out of the process. Now, Jesus walks with us. He draws near to us even when we're sad, even when we're sorrowful, even when we have tears streaming down our faces. Number three, Jesus is present in our lives even when our hopes have been shattered. In the text, Jesus asked these two disciples a couple of different times, what are you talking about? What are you discussing? And like we mentioned a few minutes ago, they reveal to Jesus in verses 19 through 24 exactly what they were talking about. They were talking about Jesus. It's a little bit ironic, isn't it? They were talking to Jesus about Jesus unknowingly. They reveal to Jesus, this third traveler that's joined them, that they're talking about Jesus' identity. They're talking about Jesus' death, something that everyone in the city of Jerusalem was aware of, something that everyone in Jerusalem had heard of. They were talking about His mysterious missing body and how they really didn't know what to do with that. If you zero in on Luke chapter 24 and verse number 21, we see how these two disciples felt about what they were discussing about their Lord. They say in verse 21, we had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. These two disciples had high hopes for Jesus. That's why they were disciples of Jesus. As the Christ, as the Messiah, they expected, they hoped that Jesus was going to be the one to deliver the Jewish nation. They had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to restore power to the Jews and overthrow the Romans who were ruling over them at this point in history. But when their Lord was nailed to a cross, when He was put to death and breathed His last breath, everything that they had hoped for about Jesus came crashing down. Everything that they had hoped for about Jesus shattered into millions of pieces. But again, in Luke 24, Jesus is still there. Even though their hopes had been shattered, Jesus was present with His disciples. The same is true in our lives. Jesus is present with us even when our hopes have been shattered. Have you ever broken a dish in the kitchen before? That's a terrible feeling, isn't it? Where you've just washed maybe a plate, you've dried it, you're just about to put it up, but then it slips through your fingers and shatters into thousands of pieces. Have you ever had that happen to something that you've hoped for? We hope for a lot of different things in this life and sometimes they don't work out. Sometimes our hopes all come crashing down only to shatter into millions of pieces. Even when that takes place, even when our hopes have been shattered, Jesus is still with us. Jesus is still present in our lives. He is still walking with us every step of the way. And then number four, and I think really the main emphasis of this text is that Jesus is present 
in the Scriptures. As the two disciples are filling Jesus in on this conversation that they're having about Jesus, Jesus responds to them with a rebuke in verse 25. He calls them foolish. He calls them slow to heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. According to verse 26, these two disciples should have known. They should have expected that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to die. They should have known. They should have expected that it was necessary, that it was essential for the Christ to subsequently be resurrected and enter into His glory. Jesus asked, was it not necessary for these things to take place? How should they have known that? How should they have expected that? Why are they receiving this rebuke from Jesus for being foolish and slow of heart? They should have known it. They should have expected it. They're receiving this rebuke because that's what the Old Testament Scriptures is all about. All throughout the prophets, throughout the entire Old Testament Scriptures, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the Christ. It's all about the Messiah and what He is going to have to do. Jesus doesn't just rebuke them and leave it at that. The centerpiece of this text comes in verse 27, where beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Imagine what that would have been like. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have a Bible study with Jesus? Can you imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to interpret for you all of the different places where He's seen throughout the Old Testament Scriptures? Imagine the connections that would have been made. Imagine the texts that they would have studied, the aha moments that they would have had where all of a sudden the light bulb turned on, everything clicked, everything fell into place in their minds. Jesus not only would have walked throughout various Old Testament passages like Isaiah 53 or Psalms 22 that point directly to Him, but He would have demonstrated to His two disciples that He is the centerpiece of the Old Testament. The meta narrative, the story that we find throughout every single Old Testament book of the story of Israel find its, finds its fulfillment in and leads directly to Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. He interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Before Jesus reveals that He's with them physically, He wants them to know that He's present in the Scriptures. We need to recognize the same thing. Jesus is present in the Scriptures. Do you know what this book is all about? Do you know what the purpose of the Bible is? As some suggest, it's not just a rule book. It's not just a list of rules and expectations that God has given to us as His people. On the other extreme, it's also not just a love letter from God, a love letter from God to His people. The purpose of this book, first and foremost, is to reveal Jesus to us. All 66 books of the Bible are about Jesus. They all point directly towards Jesus. I heard someone put it this way one time. The Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, tells us that Jesus is coming. That's the discussion that they're having on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us that Jesus has come. Acts and the rest of the New Testament, the rest of the epistles, the letters that are written, tell us that Jesus is coming back and how we need to prepare for that every day of our lives. They reveal to us how we can have a relationship with Jesus. They reveal to us how we can absolutely fall in love with Him and live a life that is in step with that. Do you feel like Jesus is absent in your life? Do you feel distant from Jesus? Do you feel like He's not there? Perhaps the reason for that is that our Bibles have remained closed for far too long. Perhaps the reason we sometimes feel that way is because we've allowed our Bibles to collect a little too much dust. Every time we open up the pages of this book, we come face to face with a Christ who loves us more than we can even imagine. Jesus draws near to us. 
Luke 24, 15. He walks with us as we go down the path of life, even when we don't recognize it, even when we're sad, even when our hopes have been shattered, when we open up the pages of God's Word, we come face to face with the presence of Jesus in our lives. I want us to ask one more question as we look at this text. How should we respond to that? How should we respond to the presence of Jesus in our lives? Well, when you look at Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35, how did these two disciples respond to the presence of Jesus in their lives? Number one, we should respond to the presence of Jesus in our lives by desiring to spend time with Him. According to Luke chapter 24 and verse 28, they eventually got to the city of Emmaus. Remember, that's where they're going. That seven mile journey from Jerusalem to the small village of Emmaus. Whenever they get there, the text says Jesus acted as if he was going to keep walking. He acted as if he were going to keep going. The two disciples didn't want him to do that. According to verse 29, they urged him strongly. They begged him saying, stay with us for it is towards evening and the day is now far spent. They wanted to spend more time with Jesus as Jesus was interpreting to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. They desired to have more of that. They wanted to spend more time with Jesus, even though they didn't recognize it was Jesus. Here's something we need to acknowledge and appreciate about Jesus. Jesus stays where he's wanted. So they invite Jesus into their home in Emmaus. Jesus enters in. They sit down at the table. They begin to eat a meal together. And it's in that moment where the blinding in verse 16 is taken away. The veil is lifted. Their eyes are open. They recognize that Jesus, their master, their Lord, their teacher, who was crucified just a few days ago, whose body is missing, He's the one who's sitting at the table with them. Immediately when they recognized that, He vanished from their sight. Because they desired to spend more time with Jesus, their eyes were opened to who was really sitting at their table. In response to Jesus' presence in our lives, we should desire, we should want to spend more time with Him. I'm afraid that as Christians, sometimes we have a mindset that we have in a number of different areas in our lives. How can I do the absolute bare minimum spiritually? and still be okay? How can I do the bare minimum in my relationship with Jesus and still have a relationship with Jesus? Sometimes we want to know that lower limit. Whenever we truly recognize the presence of Jesus in our lives, I want to suggest to you, we're not just going to do the bare minimum. Whenever we recognize and we embrace the fact, whenever we trust the fact that Jesus is close to us and He's walking with us wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we find ourselves doing, whatever is going on in our lives, when we embrace that fact, when we place our trust in that, we're going to do everything that we can to spend more time with them. We're going to have a great desire to spend more time with them, a desire that says, I can't wait for later in the day where I'm able to open up the pages of God's Word and spend time with Jesus. I can't wait, like Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, to go into the inner room to shut the door and to pray to my Father who's in the secret place. I want to spend more time with Jesus. When we recognize His presence in our lives and we have a desire to spend more time with Him, like these two disciples, our eyes are going to be opened. Our blindness is going to be taken away. Whenever we recognize Jesus' presence in our lives and we desire to spend more time with Him, our eyes are able to be opened to a greater reality of who He is and what He's doing in our lives. Number two, when in response to Jesus' presence in our lives, we should be very balanced between the head and heart. We should have a balanced response between how we feel in our hearts and what we think in our heads. That's what the two disciples had in verse number 32. As Jesus vanishes from their sight and they're left sitting around the table reflecting on the experience that they had just had, they said, did not our hearts burned within us while He talked to us on the road? That's the emotional response that they had to Jesus. Their hearts were burning within them. When we saw the two disciples just a minute ago on the road to Emmaus, they were sad. Their hopes had been shattered. They were grieving. They were sorrowful. Not anymore. 
Now they're comforted, they're encouraged, they're passionate, they're zealous, they're excited about the experience that they just had. Their hearts were burning within them. That's their emotional response. But notice what their emotional response is rooted in, in verse 32. Certainly they had an emotional response to Jesus, but it's not because some dynamic speaker was throwing out religious cliches to them. Certainly they had an emotional response to Jesus, but it's not because they turned the lights down real low and sang a 10 verse invitation song. Their emotional response to Jesus, according to verse 32, was rooted in their minds. It was rooted in a contextual, diligent, systematic study of the Scriptures. Their hearts burned within them in verse 32 while Jesus opened to them the Scriptures. In response to Jesus' presence in our lives, we should have a balanced response. A balance between the head and the heart. It seems to me that there are two extremes here, both of them being inappropriate. We can have a lot of feelings and emotions for Jesus, but then not really know anything about Scripture. Or we can treat the Bible like an academic subject where we know every Bible verse and we can answer every Bible question and we can list off every Bible fact, but we have no feelings, no passion, no emotion for the one who gave us the Bible in the first place. Both of the extremes are inappropriate. We need to strike a balance in the middle. In response to Jesus' presence in our lives, we should have an emotional response that's based on an intellectual response. Our hearts should be burning within us as we contemplate and meditate on the words of Scripture in our minds. And then finally, number three, in response to Jesus' presence in our lives, we should have an urgency to go and tell other people. These two disciples didn't waste any time. According to verse 33, they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They had just had an experience with the resurrected Lord. That wasn't something that they could keep to themselves. It's something that they had to share. And so they go back on the journey that they just completed. That very same hour, they got up from the table. They traveled seven miles back to the city of Jerusalem. They found the apostles and all of those who were gathered together with the apostles, and they announced their message. They told their story. The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Maybe a resurrection appearance, that appearance to Simon that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. They continued on, verse 35, to tell them what had happened on the road and how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of bread. Like the two disciples that we see there, in response to Jesus' presence in our lives, we should have an urgency to go and tell others. I think sometimes we overcomplicate evangelism. We think about evangelism as I need to be able to answer every single question that a person might ask me. I need to be able to know every Bible verse and I need to be able to present Scripture in such an elegant and eloquent way that nobody's going to be able to refute it. I'm going to convert this person because of how great I am and how smart I am. What if we thought about evangelism more like the two disciples in Luke chapter 24? What if we thought about evangelism simply as talking to other people about how Jesus has been present in our lives? How Jesus has drawn near to us and walked with us every step of the way. Do you think that's a message that people need to hear? Do you think that's a message that could benefit people, especially people who are going through great trial and difficulty in life? In response to His presence in our lives, we should have an urgency to go and tell other people. We have to realize there are people in our lives who are walking down a path directed towards the devil's hell. How can we not have a sense of urgency? How can we not be urgent whenever it comes to proclaiming the presence of Jesus in our lives? How He is walking with us in everything that we do and in everywhere that we go. I hope as Christians, we're able to find this encouraging. I hope that we're able to find this comforting. Jesus is present in our lives. Jesus draws near to us and walks with us every step of the way. Even 
when we don't recognize it, even when we're sad, even when our hopes have been shattered, when we open up the pages of Scripture, we come face to face with the Messiah who desires a relationship with us more than anything else. How should we respond to that? Let's make that a little bit more practical. How are we going to respond to that throughout the rest of this week? How are we going to respond to that tomorrow? Number one, we should have a desire to spend time with Jesus. Number two, we should have a balance between the head and the heart. Number three, we should have an urgency to go out and tell other people. The simple fact is this, Jesus is present in our lives. Won't you please be present with Him? Hello, thank you for being a part of this study. We appreciate each of the speakers and the wonderful lessons that they're bringing. If you have not yet picked up two of the 13 lesson lectureship books, we would encourage you to do so. We appreciate your continual love, support, and prayers for Freed Hardeman University. Our prayer is that we will always be a great resource to the Lord's kingdom. May God bless you. What's great? On one side while they eat, they get up after that and spend another two or three hours walking seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell everybody what they've seen, what they just learned, and then they stay up for how long with that, right? I've got to be in the bed at nine or I'm, I'm out. I can't, can't function anymore if I'm not in the bed at nine, right? They get up at that point at dusk, maybe a little after, and take what's probably a dangerous journey at that point in the dark seven miles and just the, the fact that they dealt with that kind of thing every day in their lives we jump in our air-conditioned vehicles and we drive down the road and they walked everywhere you know it was, a, it was a very different time obviously all right so his first question why is understanding that Jesus is present in our lives important to us all right thoughts Anybody got any thoughts on this tonight? We have real things every day, every day. So Beverly gave me that look. This is the same look I had when I read this question. It's like, well, <laughs> it's, like it's, it's core to everything that we believe. That's, that's it. We need comfort. We need the closeness. We need the reassur reassurance of Christ in our lives every day. It's core to our Christianity. And that's really the same, same first thought. How do you enunciate that? in a five word bullet point answer that's very difficult but that's what this whole lesson is about is the revelation of christ not just in luke but in scripture he alluded a lot to it in the rest of scripture and scripture is complex and involved the message is straightforward but there's a lot of message there it's not a five word bullet point answer right i need christ every day in my life we need the comfort. The other thing I think is we need the comfort of knowing there's a greater goal than day to day. We have to be focused. God made us to need that in our lives. For us to need to be focused on Him. To need to believe in something that is greater than ourselves. Christ is, is the vehicle for that. Alright, so this gets a little closer now into the application. In what ways has Jesus been present in your lives in the past? How do you see Jesus as, diff, as, as present in your, in your life? I think what he's getting at here is how close are you to Christ at various times? That's what this leads me to think anyway. This is the, the parallel that, is, that pops from my life. When times are, are great, when everything is good, we tend to float a little bit farther away from Christ. In our relationship with God, we tend to float a little bit farther away. When things are very difficult, when circumstances are challenging, we tend to come back. We pray, we seek, we're looking for help. As the old saying goes, there are no atheists that talk about people who are looking for God. 
Ch Chad's talked about this in the class over the years, and a lot of us have seen it. When you go on campaigns, people in areas that are challenged, that are uh, that struggle demographically, tend to be a little bit more open to the gospel. They tend to be a little bit more receptive to talking with you when you come to the door and accepting your invitation. The neighborhoods that are that are very affluent, very gated, very self-sustaining, they don't need you, right? They've already got their routine. Doesn't mean that we don't need to reach out to everybody, but that's the reality is that it is easier probably to sow the gospel in terms of the people that you interact with where there are challenges, where there's adversity and difficulty. How do we counteract that? That's the, that's the next thing that pops into my mind. If that's, if, if that's a given in human nature, then I want to counteract that with myself. I need to be close to Christ all the time. I think about this and, and uh, you know, there's a glide path that a pilot is using as they approach a runway. And that glide path is, is static. It doesn't move. It's in one spot. They have devices that help them tell whether they're on it or not. And the pilot is continuously working to keep that plane as close to that theoretical glide path as they can. God is that way. Christ is that way. He does not move, right? He's always there for us. And it's, it's us in our lives that tend to move away and then have to correct and come back. And when I say move, move away, that doesn't necessarily mean that I left the church and I'm completely lost. It's not what I'm saying at all. But all of our lives have this cyclical quality, this volatility, whether it's minor or it's major, there is movement in the relative level of our, our strength, our faith at any given time. So I have to be continuously pushing myself back to try to stay as close as I can to Christ. Where I'm going with that is I think in the good times, you use gratitude. You focus on recounting your blessings, thanking God for what He's given you, the fact that you didn't create all of that. Whatever it is that's good in your life, you're blessed with that because God afforded you that opportunity. Celeste. Maybe what I should say is he's always there if I seek him, right? James 4 tells us, draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you. But I don't seek him one time and then I'm done. That's not how it works. It's a, it's a continuous process that doesn't end. In what ways is Christ present in Scripture? He talked about how all Scripture points to Christ. And then this fourth question, how can we do a better job of having a balanced response to the presence of Jesus in our lives? And he's talking about emotional and logical, the, the knowledge and the, and the emotion. And what I think of here is spirit and truth. That's the first thing that pops in my head, which is really talking about our worship. But I think it's, it's all there in application. Thoughts on that? How can we, how can we strengthen the emotion? How can we strengthen the knowledge? It's not a trick question. It's, this is easy. All y'all are thinking it. I can study. Brother Alverson used the term being with Christ, right? Fellowshipping with Christ, drawing near to Him, spending time with Him. What he's saying when he says that every time is reading my Bible. That's what I have that has been given to me that has Christ in it. It is there continuously. I can read my Bible. I can pray. Those are the two ways that I am near on a continuous basis. And so my personal opinion is that emotion takes care of itself if we feed logic. The spirit part is the, is the hard part, I think. The emotion is the hard part. It's very easy to get in the habit of coming here time after time and following the same ritual and, and be, becoming rote, which is not what we're here to do. We should be thinking and engaged, and that is our hearts and minds working together. But it's got to be grounded in truth. And faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. If I want to increase my faith, I read. 
and not just read, but study with a purpose. I think too often we get in the habit of sitting down and maybe reading a chapter, which didn't exist when the Bible was written at all, right? But we, we read a chapter and think we get to the end of that chapter and we've, we've accomplished what we need to accomplish for the day or the hour or whatever, and we go away from it. We need to try to structure our study to achieve something as well. Outside of just what you get here in these, in these classes and in these sermons and discussions. Bells, notifications, right? You turn them all off. <laughs> Appreciate y'all's attention tonight. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you Sunday.